Fall 1945. The Second World War is over, but there's fresh fighting in Vietnam. Now former enemies become allies as British Indian troops, French commandos, and surrendered Japanese soldiers join in a ragtag alliance against Ho Chi Minh's communists in Saigon. The outcome will shape Vietnam's future for decades to come in Great Britain's Weird Vietnam War. In 1940, the French colony of Indochina, today's Vietnam, Laos and Cambodia, is on the front line in both the Second Sino-Japanese and the Second World War. In September, Japanese forces occupy northern Vietnam to cut off their Chinese enemies from Allied supplies via the Yunnan Haiphong Railway. Japan also forces the Vichy French authorities governing Indochina to provide economic and transit rights in exchange for France keeping nominal control. In 1941, though, Japan occupies the entire colony. Now Vietnamese nationalist Ho Chi Minh returns to Vietnam after three decades abroad. He softens his Marxist-Leninist ideology in favor of a broader independence movement. In 1941, the Indochinese Communist Party is absorbed into the larger League for the Independence of Vietnam, or Viet Minh. Its goal is to get all parts of Vietnamese society to resist the Japanese occupation and French colonialism. Rich people, soldiers, workers, peasants, intellectuals, employees, traders, youth and women who warmly love your country. As one in mind and strength, we shall overthrow the Japanese and French and their jackals in order to save people from the situation between boiling water and burning heat. The Viet Minh conduct a limited guerrilla campaign against the Japanese, but they lack experience. When the US joins the war in 1941, Ho Chi Minh has high hopes for President Roosevelt's anti-imperial discourse. Ho pledges the Viet Minh to the Allied powers and tries to contact US intelligence in China. At first though, there's little cooperation, until Japan overthrows the Vichy French in March 1945 and arrests French troops. The US sends an Office of Strategic Services team to Vietnam in July 1945, which trains and arms the Viet Minh, but Japan's capitulation in August ends official support. Instead, Ho marches on Hanoi as the Viet Minh take control of Tonkin province. The Viet Minh are generally popular in the north, especially due to their efforts to distribute food in the 1944-45 famine, and Ho's revolution culminates in announcing Vietnamese independence on September 2nd. U.S. OSS agents are at the ceremony and even salute the Viet Minh flag. OSS representative Archimedes Paddy even becomes a local celebrity. Paddy himself is impressed with Ho. On the day of the proclamation of independence and right before being recalled from the mission, he sends a sober outlook for the future of Vietnam to his higher-ups. Ho Chi Minh impresses me as a sensible, well-balanced, politically-minded individual. His demands are few and simple, namely limited independence, liberation from French rule, the right to live as free people in a family of nations, and lastly, the right to deal directly with the outside world. From what I've seen, these people mean business, and I'm afraid that the French will have to deal with them. For that matter, we will all have to deal with them. Although Roosevelt opposed the return of French colonial power after the war, his successor President Truman has other concerns. He's sympathetic to Vietnamese nationalism, but also wants a restored France as a reliable ally against the Soviet Union in Europe. Ho sends letters to Truman asking for recognition, but State Department officials prevent their delivery. Instead, the US announces it is not against French sovereignty in Indochina, but will not intervene to restore it. The US does participate in the post-war division of Vietnam into two zones. Despite the ongoing Chinese civil war, nationalist China is to occupy the north and the British the south. Meanwhile, Ho's provisional government spreads its influence, though the Chinese occupation, which includes widespread looting, limits his power base in Tonkin. Meanwhile, the Vietnamese set up a southern Viet Minh committee in Saigon, the political and economic center of the southern Annam province. But the Viet Minh is weaker inside Saigon and rushes to establish its presence before British troops arrive. Luckily for them, US General Douglas MacArthur delays the British arrival until after he accepts the Japanese surrender, meaning they arrive a week late on September 11th. This gives the Viet Minh time to establish a small power base, but the British force, mostly Indian troops, lands alongside French troops, including Free French Commandos. Although there is some internal disagreement, Britain has decided to support French control. 
Britain is concerned about anti-colonialism spreading to their own colonies occupied by Japan during the war. A restored French Indochina, on the other hand, can trade with British colonies and solidify France as a powerful ally. The potential threat to Australia, New Zealand, India, Burma, Malaya, and the East Indies archipelago, resulting from Indochina being in the hands of a weak or unfriendly power, has been sufficiently demonstrated by the action of Japan in the Second World War. To oversee the transition, codenamed Operation Mastodon, Britain sends Major General Douglas Gracie. His orders are specific. Accept the Japanese surrender, process Japanese soldiers, and repatriate French prisoners. He is to avoid internal politics and not acknowledge Ho's government. When he arrives, he ignores a Vietnamese welcome delegation and later speaks of his distrust. I went out there after the war and saw the French after they'd been through a most uncomfortable time with the Japanese. I was welcomed on arrival by the Viet Minh, who said welcome and all that sort of thing. It was a very unpleasant situation, and I promptly kicked them out. They are obviously communists. When Gracie arrives, Saigon has no functional government. Rioting and looting is common, including by French former prisoners, as well as Vietnamese militant religious sects and other political groups. Although Ho Chi Minh calls for no violence, the Viet Minh conducts targeted killings of political enemies, including those who collaborated with French and Japanese. Still armed Japanese guards provide little security, while French residents demand Gracie restore their position. Gracie generally sides with the French, though he encourages them to soften their rule. But he only has 1,300 troops to process 70,000 Japanese soldiers. Security concerns in Saigon means that he arms French prisoners and brings Japanese guards into a scratch security force. British reinforcements are on the way, but will take weeks to arrive in full. Gracie's actions clash with his own superior, Lord Louis Mountbatten, as well as US OSS representative Peter Dewey, who's much more critical of a French return. So Gracie declares Dewey persona non grata. On September 21st, 1945, Gracie decrees new rules for Saigon, extending a nighttime curfew and banning public demonstrations, and the unauthorized carry of arms. Vietnamese groups complain the rules unfairly target them and accuse Gracie of impartiality. The Viet Minh responds with a general strike, which Gracie fears is just a prelude to an attack. Some Vietnamese groups, especially the Trotskyists, are planning one, but the Viet Minh mostly wants negotiations. On September 23rd, Gracie supports a French coup in Saigon, arming 1,400 French POWs who seize key buildings. In the struggle, two Frenchmen are killed and many Vietnamese civilians beaten. In retaliation, a group of Vietnamese, likely Trotskyists, attack a French residential district the next day, killing over 200, including women and children. Gracie arms more French prisoners, and by September 24th, general street fighting breaks out. Ho Chi Minh is distressed by events, but publicly supports the uprising, as does the Southern Viet Minh Committee. Grab weapons and rise up to force out the invading forces. Wipe out the French bandits, wipe out their collaborators. At first, the Viet Minh isolate Saigon and fight conventionally. They also try to seize key transport nodes, like the Binh Loi Bridge. However, British Indian troops repel the attacks and bring in supplies via river barges. The Viet Minh launch attacks inside the city, and one of their ambushes kills Peter Dewey. The Viet Minh claim their men mistook his unmarked jeep for a French vehicle, and Dewey is the first American killed in Vietnam. British Indian troops relieve Saigon by September 28th, but the small force is exhausted, so Gracie turns to the Japanese for help. But Japanese allegiance is ambiguous, and some soldiers prefer to remain in Indochina than be repatriated to Japan. After interviewing Japanese veterans, historian Kiyuchi Tachikawa outlined their reasons. First, support for the independence movement. Second, avoiding war crime prosecution. Third, some had the chance to meet local people and became convinced to stay. Rumors spoke of Japan having turned into a burnt field, that if they returned, there would be nothing to eat. Some of these stay-behinds go on to cooperate with Viet Minh groups, including training and directing operations. Gracie notes the Japanese commander is angry at his troops' behavior, but has little control. Even so, Japanese troops become instrumental in British operations, including rescuing French prisoners from Viet Minh troops in Saigon. 
From October 1st to 10th, there's a ceasefire, which ends when the Viet Minh ambush a British Indian patrol. The brief pause is enough to bring in professional French troops under General Leclerc. British Indian troops stop attacks on Saigon's airport on October 12th, and with Saigon mostly secure, the British-French-Japanese force goes on the offensive. The objective is to secure the Triangle, an area between three towns northeast of Saigon. In this zone, Japanese troops can be concentrated, disarmed and processed, but Viet Minh troops control the Triangle. From October 23rd to 25th, the British 100th Brigade clear out the three towns of Viet Minh and start processing Japanese prisoners. On October 24th, French troops secure towns in Saigon's southwest, while British troops burn down much of Saigon's commercial district in anti-Viet Minh operations. On October 29th, British-led forces in the Triangle are reformed into Gate Force, an armoured car column now including 500 Japanese infantrymen. It moves east to preempt Viet Minh attacks. Another British force, Clarkall, in conjunction with French troops, heads northwest, while French armour moves into the Mekong Delta. At Chuan Lok, Gate Force encounters Viet Minh troops in a rubber plantation. The British use armoured cars, while the Japanese launch a Banzai attack at night. The Viet Minh conduct a Banzai-style attack of their own, and the two forces clash in hand-to-hand -hand combat. 250 Viet Minh and one Brit are killed, but the British do not record Japanese losses. The Battle at Chuan Lok destroys the Viet Minh in that region. By November, Viet Minh resistance is crumbling under heavy losses and the British accelerate processing Japanese troops. They hand over security to the French, who struggle against the resurgent Viet Minh in the central highlands. Gracie accepts the Japanese surrender on November 30th, and by late December, British troops start leaving Indochina. In early 1946, the British feel they've restored French sovereignty in Vietnam. They had not expected such resistance, and opposition at home and abroad is growing. Some in Britain's leftist Labour government question why Britain was assisting a French colonial adventure, and even some British officers criticised French behaviour in Indochina. They really were a band of pretty unruly cutthroats. Their method of pacifying a village without any provocation was to drive through in American three-ton trucks, 30 caliber machine guns on the cab, all guns firing on alternate sides of the street at first floor level. They seldom hit anyone, but if that is the way friends arrive, it is little wonder that the Vietnamese threw them out. Gracie also complains to Leclerc about French racism towards the British Indian troops, while Indian nationalists question why they're there at all. Indians watched with growing anger, shame and helplessness that Indian troops should be used for doing Britain's dirty work against our friends, who are fighting the same fight as we. Britain wants out of Indochina and hopes the US will step in to support France. Gracie takes much of the blame, but his supporters claim he followed orders and made the best of a bad situation. In hindsight, some have questioned why Britain did so well against the Viet Minh in 1945, while the more powerful French and US forces later struggled. Firstly, the Viet Minh were nowhere near as sophisticated in the 1940s as they became in the 1950s or later as the Viet Cong. There was internal division between Northerners and Southerners, and the Viet Minh was only one of several groups competing in Saigon. Commanders had very limited control of their troops, and there was little overarching strategy. Key figures like Ho Chi Minh and Pho Nguyen Jap remained in the North. The Viet Minh also stuck to conventional tactics, only turning to guerrilla methods once they lost Saigon. But even here they lacked experience or equipment. Few knew how to maintain a machine gun, and some even carried bows or bamboo spears. British Indian and Gurkha troops, on the other hand, had lots of experience fighting in Burma or from occupation duties on the violent northwestern Indian frontier. British commanders attacked with caution, keeping open a line of retreat. Despite the disobedience of some, Japanese troops also contributed greatly and did not oppose the British in an organized manner. Importantly, British goals in Vietnam were extremely limited, handing over control to the French and processing Japanese troops. It was clear when these objectives were achieved, and there was no need to pacify the entire country or even all of Saigon. The Vietnamese people, especially in the south, were also hesitant to support a new war. Some, including Ho Chi Minh, still hoped France would negotiate a liberal policy and roadmap to independence. But these hopes are uncertain. 
In the north, the Chinese Civil War causes Chinese nationalists to change their policy and allow the French to return if they enter into talks with Ho. For now, the future of Indochina might be decided at the negotiation table, but that option won't last long. 1945 was a turning point in warfare. Just a few weeks before Gracie landed in Saigon to engage in one of the first unconventional conflicts of the Cold War, the US had dropped two atomic bombs over Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The unimaginable destructive power of the atomic bomb now had to be considered in future wars. But the potentially limitless energy could also be harnessed for civilian use, and indeed Joseph Stalin was keen to use it for his vision of atomic-powered communism. If you want to learn more about this topic, in our new series Red Atoms, we explore the origins of the first Soviet atom bomb all the way to the Chernobyl disaster and beyond. And where can you watch Red Atoms? On Nebula, a streaming service we're building together with other creators. Nebula is a platform where we don't have to worry about the algorithm or advertiser guidelines and where the viewers support us directly. This allows us to produce series like Red Atoms or our World War II series 16 Days in Berlin and Rhineland 45. And that's not all. Apart from watching other creators' original documentaries, like the Battle of Britain series from Real Engineering, your Nebula subscription also includes classes, where you can learn useful skills directly from Nebula creators. In our newest class, I take you through the entire production process of a real-time history video and give a glimpse behind the scenes of what it takes to produce a great history documentary. If you sign up at nebula.tv slash realtimehistory, you get 40% off an annual subscription and support our channel at the same time. For just $30, you can watch Nebula Originals, all our content ad-free and earlier than on YouTube, other Nebula creators, and also Nebula classes, and much more. As usual, you can find all the sources for this episode in the video description below. If you're watching this video on Nebula or Patreon, thank you so much for your support. We couldn't do it without you. I'm Jesse Alexander, and this is a production of Real Time History, the only history channel run by a band of pretty unruly cutthroats.